Roz Samuel Smith, you brought me here to Frith Street in Soho. Why are we here? Well, Frith Street is very important to the story of Dr. John Snow because it's the only blue plaque that we have in London to John Snow, and there it is on the building ahead of us. Um, it was on the wall of a vegetarian restaurant, which is quite appropriate because he was a lifelong vegetarian. Um, he worked here when he became a professional doctor. So the first thing which strikes me is got his uh, birthday and his death, 1813 to mm -hmm. 1858. So he wasn't very old when he died, and you're no. only 45. That's right, he was very young indeed. Um, he died of what they called apoplexy, which we'd call a stroke today. Uh -huh. And it's likely that um, for most of his life he suffered from renal hypertension, which may be why he was a lifelong teetotaler as well as a vegetarian. Um, it, it does seem very unfair and sad that somebody so brilliant should have died so young. He was essentially a scientist doctor at a time when many doctors um, learned apprenticeships by sitting at the knee of a country doctor and really learned very little science at all. And what we have to think, um, living in the time of cholera, it was the mystery of the time. Every scientist and doctor who could put pen to paper was producing a tome on cholera. If you go to the British Library and you just research on cholera, it, it is amazing how many works there were. People produced maps, they produced um, theories. Of course, they didn't have the germ theory. If you imagine the early 1800s, we're still very much dominated by what's called the miasma so this, this is kind of the idea that it spreads through the air? Yeah. It's the idea that evil vapours, I think it actually literally means evil smoke, um, can emanate from putrefying matter, from sewage, from um, mud that's contaminated with dead animals and so on. Um, naturally, it's... It, more common where the poor people live because they tend to live lower down and it's the start of the idea that living on high places protects you so you get in london the vale of heath up in in hampstead where um, the wealthy go to live whereas the poor are living near the river mm -hmm. and, and and of course they were right in a way if you were yeah. poor and living by the river you probably had very poor drainage you probably had a very poor diet and so you probably did get more illnesses so but they were right for the wrong reasons they were right but that's often the case and with the miasma theory the cleaning up that they did was also right for the wrong reasons because um what they started to do they realized that all this sewage in this open streets i mean this street fifth street if we were um in it in the early 1800s there's probably been a big gully down the center full of um, horse manure there'd be of course loads of animals remember um, all fresh meat has to be kept within the city we don't have refrigeration so there would be the occasional cattle pigs going through obviously dogs cats so basically a lot of refuse and people um, even then said no this is disgusting this yeah. must be making us ill and you can see how that makes a lot of sense to humans we have a very very sensitive sense of smell so the, the john snow blue plaque it says anaesthetist and epidemiologist yes anaesthetist that, that would have been a, a term which existed at the time what about epidemiology epidemiologist didn't exist at the time in fact the word epidemic originally from the french epidemie it is in britain that we first start to hear the um, epidemiology and epidemiologist being used, um, very much being applied to populations. In its earlier meaning, um, it meant really, uh, it could be any outbreak of an infection, it could be just a few cases. But in those days, they didn't have a science of statistics, they didn't have a science of public health. So um, by the time he gets to Frith Street, he's actually doing quite well because he's already practicing as an anaesthetist. If you see his notebooks, which have been transcribed brilliantly, um, but the original notebooks are kept at the Royal College of Physicians, but he appears to have worked almost every day of his life. There was just a brief period in the 1854 outbreak when he didn't um, see patients for a fortnight because he was investigating the cholera outbreak. Otherwise, it was work, work, work for Dr. Snow. So would he have been living here during that outbreak? Interestingly, he had recently moved to Sackville Street, okay. down in Piccadilly, so we could walk in that direction. Let's walk in that direction. Yeah. When Snow was living here, what kind of area was this? Was it a particularly well-to-do area, or, or was it as noisy as it is today, do you think? It would have been um, very noisy and, for the most part, very poor. And there would have been wealthier streets. Now, Frith Street um, would have been successful merchants and um, doing quite well. Um, if you look at Sackville Street, where Snow had moved to at the time of the outbreak, that was very smart indeed. Now we associate Sackville Street with tailoring and smart part of Piccadilly, and, and it was then. 
So um, there were parts of Soho that were grander than others. In general, it was poor and lively and very cosmopolitan, the so-called Mediterranean island of London. When Snow investigated the cholera outbreak, um, he found that there were houses where there was a family in each room. And remember, they had no sanitation. They would have a cesspit pit at the back. And at night, they would just chuck it out the window. And then um, water supply was very limited. If you were lucky enough to have a water supply to your house, it would be for two hours a day. Right. Probably. And that would be just straight from the Thames into your house? Uh, straight from the um, Thames, they did. Um, in some cases, they filtered it. And of course, it depended which um, river they took it from. So in London, you had the New River Company, which is drawing water from Hertfordshire. Yeah. Wow. And, so and, yeah, well, that would be supplying Islington. Very nice water. But you'd have, say, the Southwark Water Company or the Vauxhall Water Company. And they're right down by the river. Um, so it would depend on how much sewage was going in at any time. You've got all the evils of, um, of the city. Um, and London is the first city in the world to reach a population of a million. Right. That's just after 1800. Oh, we're just passing St. Anne's Soho. And that's interesting because there were three churches that Dr. John Snow consulted the records for deaths to investigate the cholera outbreak. And St. Anne's is one of them. So, and what was he looking for mm. when he consulted the churches? What he was looking for was deaths recorded in the register. He and um, the curate, Henry Whitehead, um, his name was Whitehead, and he, um, he should be credited with being a very early epidemiologist because um, obviously John Snow was very busy. And although he did spend the two weeks, you know, really working on it nonstop, um, the follow-up, a lot of that, was done by the curate and the door-to-door the -door interviews. And basically, by interviewing every single house where there'd been a death, um, they had a little questionnaire. It was yeah. very modern in our terms. I mean, w there were plenty of people who drew maps. There were plenty of people who came up with theories and investigations. But what was remarkable about the way Snow approached this outbreak was from the start, in a very scientific way. So the fa even doing a questionnaire, which we'd call descriptive epidemiology, yeah. um, showed a very, very systematic approach. And he didn't just do that. He looked for what we'd now call in epidemiology the outlying case. And in the same way, this cholera outbreak was partly solved by Snow having the, um, the, the brilliant intuition to particularly focus on the people that didn't fit in. So, for instance, there was um, a woman who was a widow. Yeah. Her husband had made um, percussion caps, which is a type of explosive. Britain very big on making explosives at that time, on Broadwick Street. And when he died, um, the firm continued, but she had enough money to move up to Hampstead, the Vale of Health and she missed the water, the lovely water of Soho. So um, her son sent a big flagon of this water up to Hampstead every day. And tragically, she was the only case in Hampstead of cholera during that epidemic. And in fact, there was only one case in Islington and Snow found that it was her niece who'd been visiting that day. But the brilliance of Snow, which we would now take a second nature. I mean, yeah. after all, we've had Sherlock Holmes since then and the dog that didn't bark in the night and all of that. But remember, Snow's working before any of this. What you have to picture is these houses all around us would have had the two hours water supply to the ground floor only, of course, most cases. And then on Sunday, no water because they wouldn't let the water workers um, toil on a Sunday. So that even wealthy people would send out for water. Everybody needed pumps. This, this is the days before running water in your own house, you'd have to go out. Well, you'd have you'd have running water for a short time. You'd have it maybe at the kitchen sink, right. it, and that would be um, not all houses. But for most people, they would have to supplement whatever water they had from the tap with pump water. And every square and every major junction would have had a big pump. And these pumps were not really maintained in any way. They were shallow wells. They would have a brick lining. Um, unfortunately, there is a problem with superficial wells, and that's because they go through the earth, they have all the contamination, all the soil organisms, all the animal dung. And sadly, in the case of very overcrowded London with no proper sewers, we have human dung clustering round the, um, 
around some of these pumps. And in the case of this one in Broadswick Street, there was a cesspit at the back of the house, but a lot of people just threw their slops out onto the street near the pump. It's hard for us to imagine people doing that because it seems such a stupid thing to do. But remember, they've got no sense of the transmission of germs. They, they know about dirt, but these are poor people. And the alternative to chucking it out the window is having a bucket of, say, diarrhoea in your room where the whole family is living all night. And I think most people would think it's more healthy to get rid of it. And did Jon Snow look at that water under the microscope? Did he find anything? No, but there were other people that did. Snow never really pursued the germ theory at that microbial level. Mm -hmm. He was more interested in the science, if you like, the logic. Actually, where we're standing now, we're looking um, towards Sackville Street, which would be just beyond, um, just around that corner. We could imagine Sackville Street so close to where we're going that um, when he heard about the outbreak, it would have meant he could have had his supper and nipped out and done his, his investigation. You know, a lot of epidemiology, like everything else in life, is time and place and luck. Um, not all epidemiologists happen to land upon a new disease and get named after it or whatever. And he happened to be next to the most intense outbreak of cholera that London has ever known. And he was the man of the moment. Right because place, right time. And, and he's, he was the right man because he had the brilliance to solve it. So this is Golden Square. Yes, this is Golden Square. Well, there are many cases. Now, Golden Square is an interesting case. Not as poor as the little streets around it. It had been grander. In the maybe the 1700s and the 1600s, certainly, there would have been ambassadors and mistresses of kings and so on. By the time of the 19th century, it's come down a bit. Um, in fact, if you think of novels like Nicholas Nickleby, Dickens puts the evil uncle, if you know the proper Nickleby, um, he's a merchant living in Golden Square. <clears throat> he's wealthy, but he's a bit disreputable. So, there's, so it's, it's getting a bit seedy, but it's still definitely fairly affluent. And therefore, there was a big rumpus from the people living here, who were visiting here, when they got cholera, because it was seen as a disease of poor people in general. Um, I mean, it's all very well, you know, the Durham miners going down with it. But when you have, you know, middle class and upper class Londoners going down with it, it gets to the Times. And you have famously a letter being written to the Times where um, it's written in charmingly broken English, so it's obviously not from a very poor citizen, just saying um, we need sewers, we need water, and, you know, the, the great wealthy men who are running these things couldn't, don't give a damn, and when the cholera comes, God help us. And people were terrified of cholera. So it arrives in Europe in the 1830s, but from then on, it's, it's um, king cholera. It's, it's a disease that is, is, is terrifying because it can kill you in 24 hours, mainly through fluid loss, of course. And they didn't know how to replace fluid loss like we do now. Now, if we step over here, this is a lovely mosaic which shows us all the characters from Soho. And if you look at the lady with the blue bonnet, to the right, there's a man with thinning hair and a black suit. Can you see him just oh, yes. rather looking into her bonnet? That's Jon Snow. Very sadly, has been placed behind the bonnet. It looks like a 19th century version of uh, the Sergeant, Sergeant Pepper, Sergeant Pepper album, Yeah, it, it does. It really does. I mean, you've got Mozart there. And in fact, Mozart um, performed on Fifth Street, which mm -hmm. we've been down. Um, you have Casanova, who um, frequently visited. And there you've got Karl Marx with Das Kapital. Um, the lady in blue is Teresa Cornelius. She ran an assembly rooms, which would be the, the modern equivalent of a sort of nightclub. Yeah. And um, she got into trouble because she provided more services than just refreshments, I think. Anyway, not, not that John Snow would have known about that, from, no. what, from what you've said. And, and also, it was well before his time. So if we stand there, we can see, there's John Snow. We have very few pictures of him. That's based on, a, on the only photograph we have of him. As you can see, he's looking very serious, staring at Teresa Cornelius's bonnet. Ah, uh, here. So what, what are we looking at here? Well, here we are at the John Snow pub. And it's been called the John Snow because it's on the site where the original pump was in Broad Street this street which is now called Broadwick Street. And the original site of the pump is marked by this, this pink granite stone. What's what we're looking yes, at Yes, we're going here? to go and have a look at the pump. 
So we're approaching an old-fashioned. Is it a model? It's not a working model. No, it's a it's a it's a a model of a pump. Iron facsimile of the original pump. This is a typical Victorian pump, um, and it would have gone down like this into the ground. But then, um, obviously, there'd be a pump mechanism up here. There'd be a handle, which you notice has been absent from this pump. And then, uh, as you went down, it would be a narrow brick well that eventually would go down into um, what they would have seen as safe. But if we look back to where the pump was, this was a, a tenement building. Um, the first case of cholera in that terrible outbreak during a, a heat wave in 1854 um, was in the baby of a family living in the ground floor room. Yeah. And almost certainly, um, like people who lived on the upper floors probably, they throw their slops out onto the street and it drained around the, the pump. And although you see from the street there would have been, you know, some paving stones and so on, um, what they couldn't see was the rotting bricks below. And in fact, when they excavated the pump, sometime after the outbreak, a few months after the outbreak, they found that the bricks had rotted away and that there was sewage mixing in with the water. Now, sewage in itself um, might give you the runs and a bit of tommy rut, but wouldn't give you cholera every day. So clearly what had happened is some cholera had come into London. The baby's father was a policeman. Maybe he had more contact with high-risk areas. Who knows? Um, he eventually got it himself and perished as well, the father of the first baby um, who got it. But um, normally, you wouldn't have cholera in the London water supply, and it would move through fairly quickly. And some people have criticised the fact that Jon Snow makes this amazing um, intervention. He goes to the parish guardians of the St James Piccadilly Church, and he persuades them, that the parish guardians being in charge of health and welfare at that time, to remove the handle of the pump. So it doesn't work? In a way, a futile gesture. But Snow, um, it's also a brilliant gesture. Snow says the pump is the source of the illness. So taking the handle off when most of the people have caught it, you might say, well, why bother? And also it cut people off from a water supply. It was a very unpopular move. But in fact, that was one of the reasons why they start to ban superficial wells. And they realised that if these wells can get contaminated, they're not really a reliable source of water. But the fact that this pump doesn't have a handle makes it an international symbol of public health. What this demonstrated, at a stroke, you can prevent disease. This is a bit of a first. And um, the May, obviously we have vaccination, we have chlorination of water, we have amazing things that have come in since then. And yet, this is still one of the most powerful symbols of what true preventive medicine can do.